I got nervous to get it looked at because I knew how much pain I was in. Like I couldn't really push my wrist back. I couldn't like at home, I couldn't hold a plate or a cup. Mm. Um, so after each game, I was wearing like a brace to keep it, you know, stable. I had to sleep in it. Um, but I was, I was nervous to go get it checked out because I never want somebody to tell me I can't play. himself Jason Tatum what's up what's up I mean I would say like it's good to see you but I just watched you play in Jamal Crawford's program you want to bring this to you oh yeah I will say I need you to set the scene for everybody that wasn't there <laughs> about how good the energy was in there but also how hot it was <laughs> yeah uh it was, the atmosphere was was crazy my first time in Seattle um, even pulling up to the gym, all the fans waiting outside. It was everything that you could expect it to be. Um, so, you know, you walk in, we walk in a practice gym and, you know, you see everybody and getting dressed and getting ready for the game. Um, you know, I'm doing my warm up stuff like I would before a real game. Uh, but when we walk up the steps and they open the doors, it was, uh, it was incredible. Yeah. Walking onto the court, the, hearing them say our name and the kids going crazy. I think that's really what you do it for. The mm -hmm. excitement on kids' faces. Um, it's nothing better than that. Yeah. It really was. That's what stick out or stuck out to me, too, was like whenever you would be near a kid or LeBron would be near a kid or Jante's near a kid, they almost can't believe it. Mm -hmm. Like their faces just light up. And I think that obviously because we work in this industry, we're in sports, we're so used to seeing all the stars. But to so many of them, <clears throat> that's the only time they'll probably ever see you all that close. For sure. And it's just like really special. No, it was. It was uh, It was an incredible one. You know, I think I'm a big deal, but when LeBron walked out there <laughs> and it's like, I know Brian and like we see him all the time, but you know, these people would see him on TV, you know, they haven't seen him play in years. So the kids lost their mind when he walked on the court. And that was just like a, that was a cool moment to see. Like oh, to, yeah. to be there and see that. Yeah, and it's like he walks in and he's like hyping up the crowd. It was like he was parting the Red Sea. <laughs> like everyone walked out and everyone separated. It was really, really cool. Okay, so for people looking in, they're just on Twitter and they see, okay, LeBron's going to play in a program. Then DeJounte and Paolo and Chet, then you. How does this happen? How does everyone come together? Uh, for me, it was super last minute. Yeah. Um, I've been talking to Jamal throughout the summer. Um uh, and I told him I would be out in L.A. And once I start back working out, you know, I would love to come up for a weekend. And, uh, you know, because obviously I took some time off after the finals mm -hmm. and it got down to the last two weekends. And uh, thanks to you, I couldn't go today because we had this <laughs> and uh, I had prior arrangements next weekend. Yeah. Uh, so yesterday was the only real day. And you had you played a part in, in, in me going um, with you and Jamal convincing me. Um, but you know, I just I called Brian at eight o'clock on Friday night, and he was like, "Yo, come up! Like we be on the same team." And uh, I was like, "All right." And yeah. I never been to Seattle, so I got on a plane Saturday morning, uh, and it happened. Yeah, it was such a moment. I mean, okay, you made what five threes, six threes, just in the first half. First quarter. Yeah, for my, my bad. First quarter, <laughs> you were really feeling it. What do you attribute like that to so early? Uh, the crowd, yeah, the atmosphere, playing in an environment that you've never played in before, mm. um, and just you know, even though it's a game for fun, I'm such a competitor that like, you know, I wasn't just going up there to get some shots up. Like I know it's not the the playoffs, but I wanted to put on a show. Yeah. You know, I wanted somebody to leave that gym and be like, man, I remember that day. You know, Jason Tatum came to Seattle and lit it up. Um, mm. So the atmosphere, you know, it's NBA guys on the court, you know, how hot it was, um, you know, that's, 
I feel like God, that's when I'm in, in my element. And, yeah. you know, I get between those lines. You know, I just, you know, get in my zone. Has a summer after going to the finals felt different than your other summers? A thousand percent. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so many different dynamics, right? You know, we played two and a half months longer than everybody else. I, uh, and I don't have shit to celebrate, yeah. right? So it's like you get all the way to the finals, you play longer than everybody else, and then, you know, you have nothing to celebrate. Um, you have a, such a shorter off season, um, you know. And every, I, I, I realized playing in the finals, everybody watches the finals. Mm-hmm. So if I was recognizable before the season, it has been magnified times a thousand yeah. um, ever since, you know, the season been over, has been over with. But I would think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're probably treated differently amongst the peers. Like making it to the finals yeah. is a stamp of something on you. Do you feel that? For sure. Uh, you know, we we all respect each other and we know how hard it is to accomplish first team all NBA or going to the finals, whatever it may be. So uh, I, I guess, I, you know, you do get a little more respect or um you know, from other guys, because, you know, being this is my fifth year, um, you know, you know how hard it is to do that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even getting to that point, you know, so guys, you know, tip their hat or whatever. And, you know, when I see them. Yeah. Because I mean, obviously you're already Jason Tatum. But like once you go to the finals, you're Jason Tatum. You know, like, but like what does that mean? It means that you accomplished the thing that people ex- expected of you. Obviously, you fell short, mm-hmm. but you made it to that point. And it felt like that was such a monkey on your back, too. Yeah. Uh, but, like, when you say you're Jason Tatum, like, me and my mom joke about joke about it all the time. It's hard for me to view myself yeah. how other people view me. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like I'm that same kid that lived with my mom and back in mm-hmm. St. Louis. And, like, mm-hmm. you know, to her, I'm her baby. And to Deuce, I'm just daddy. Yeah. But, you know, people like when you reference it like that, it's still like I'm not used to that. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. But I mean, to that kid at the pro-am, when you're in front of him, he's like, no, no, no. This is Jason Tatum. Yeah. And I do think you probably are at a point in your life where you're wondering, OK, I know like who I am at my core. But I also know that there's all these other people around that think I'm something else. And do you ever think to yourself, what is that identity? Or do you feel strong in what that identity is? Uh, that is a great question. Um, and it's something that you just have to adjust to. Um, it's not normal. Mm-hmm. It, it, it isn't to go in public places and people lose their mind or you walk into a restaurant or the gas station and people just immediately pull their phone out and record you. And, you know, um, people would say, like, well, you asked for that, you know, being in your position, um, which I guess is true. But it's still, you know, I'm still like a human being. And and there's a balance, right? You know, going into the gym and seeing kids lose their mind is, is, is one thing. But, mm-hmm. you know, walking into a restaurant and people trying to – grown people, people older than me, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the part that gets – the thing that gets me is, like, Kids, I understand. I could have a sandwich in my mouth and a kid would tap me on my hand, like, can I get a picture? I understand. But it's like when it's adults and they like trying to sneak a picture in the restaurant, it's like, you know, how would you feel if somebody did that to you? It's just not, it's not normal. Yeah. So what do you feel like you have given up to be who you are? Ooh. Any sense of normalcy, privacy, um and every yeah, it's just like everybody um exaggerates anything you do, anything you say, mm-hmm. anywhere you're you are, um good, bad, or indifferent. Um and just being able to do things without any interruption, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna try and make this question make sense. But is being like Jason Tatum, the basketball player, in like direct conflict with what your personality is? Um, No, because I think I play basketball the same way that I act. Okay. 
But I mean, like, would you say you're an introverted person? Would you say that you're a shy person? Would you say you're outgoing? Like, it's having to be what everyone wants you to be opposite of, like, what you'd be if you were just at home. Uh, I'm not shy. I'm not the most outgoing person. Um, I don't know. Like, if I don't know you, I, like, I yeah. Cause like I don't think you're shy, but I would get why someone would think yeah, you're shy. Yeah, like if you don't know me, I, uh, people tell me all the time, like you know, before I, I met you, I thought you were this way, or I assume these things about you. You know, you never really speak during the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had teammates, like I remember Josh Richardson came to the team this year, and he was like, he was like, yo, you actually really cool. <laughs> I'm like, damn, thanks. He was like, bro, like every time we played against each other, you just never said anything. I said, well, Jay Rich, I didn't know you. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, 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 it's as simple as that. Like, yeah. But, you know, around my friends and family, you know, I joke all the time and, and play and laugh. Um, but I guess I've just always been a more laid back person. And I guess that's what um, most people see. Um, yeah. You know, most people don't know the real me. Yeah. No, I feel that. You know, I always think about when I interviewed Kimba Walker for my GQ piece. And one thing he talks about is like, you know, when I met Jason, I just thought he was just this little light skinned kid from Duke. So what role do you think like playing at Duke plays <laughs> <laughs> and the perception that people have of you? Yeah, the the narrative around kids that go to Duke, especially like before my time and like when I got there and even when I was growing up, it was like, you know, guys like Grant Hill go to Duke. Which is, I love Grant, but like, he's great. you know, privileged, two-parent households are like, you know, they take the the good kids. Like, you know, they don't take the kids from around the block or, you know, from the inner city. Um, and not that I didn't like Duke growing up. I just never thought that, like, Coach K would want me to go there. Like, he would come mm-hmm. to my house. So, yeah, going to Duke definitely plays a part. I'm light-skinned. <laughs> I got curly hair. <laughs> Right, I dress nice, so you know there's definitely a perception that comes with that until you, you know, really get to know me. Yeah, no, absolutely, and it, it's funny because I remember when I was talking to Kim about it, me and him were also just discussing like how we know that is what people think of you, but it really is very opposite mm-hmm. of what you're actually like. So that's always interesting. I want to get into in a bit later how your personality plays a role into how you lead and also how you play basketball. But, of course, I want to talk about the finals. So when I say 2022 NBA finals, what image pops in your head? Um, You know, us walking off the court at home and seeing them celebrate on our floor. Uh, That is an image, a memory, a feeling that, you know, I'll probably never, ever forget. How often do you think about that image? Every day. Um, And it doesn't help every time I see somebody, you know, man, good job in the finals. You'll be back. I was rooting for you. I'm just just constantly reminded every day. Um, And that's the tough part about the offseason after you lose. It's just like you, human nature would, you know, want you to be like, you know, I just can't wait to get back there. But it's like, nope, you got to start back over. You got to take the proper steps. You got to rest and recover, get ready for the training camp, go into training camp, all preseason, start the regular season. Like, it's a process. You can't just, like, coach through it and be like, yeah, we're going to get back there because it's not promised. Yeah. Um, and we we can't have that mindset that, um, it, you know, it's going to be given to us. So what's that post-finals process for you? Meaning, like, okay, have you rewatched that series? Yeah. Uh, it was tough. Yeah. And from the standpoint of, like, regardless of what everybody was saying about me and how I played um, afterwards, you know, I never really pay attention to that, good or bad. You know, I know what I'm capable of, and I know I could have done more. And that was the toughest part of, you know, feeling like I let my team down at the biggest moment. Um, And that hurt me more than what anybody else could have said or, you know, could think about me. Um, You know, those... Three, four days afterward, I was I was miserable. Uh, I really, really was. And it took some time to, like, you know, kind of get out of that funk um, mm-hmm. and just kind of enjoy my life, enjoy being around my son and my family. Yeah. 
So when you say you're miserable, what does that mean? How did that like manifest in your day to day? Um, I, I, it's just tough. Um, you know, because I feel like sometimes I come off so laid back that I don't know if people understand how much I invest into this game, how much I care, how hard I work. Um, cause I'm not like the loudest or, you know, may show everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was just so tough because I literally gave everything that I had. Um, and you know, to feel like I ran out that I didn't have anything left to give. And we were so close, um, you know, really, you know, I, I didn't have an appetite. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to go anywhere. Um, you know, I just was like in my house for like three, four days straight, you know, didn't want to do anything. Um, because I just know how hard it is to get to that point and thinking about everything that, you know, I and my team went through to get there um, and not getting over, getting over that hump um, was the worst, is the worst feeling. So when you're watching it and you're feeling these feelings, do you say to yourself, like, I'm a better player than what I showed in these finals? Oh, for sure. And, you know, everybody knows that. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I don't take offense to, you know, what everybody was saying. Because mm -hmm. if I wasn't that good, you know, they wouldn't have talked about me. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, some people would kill to be in that position for everybody to be talking about them, yeah. good or bad. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's all of what, what should I have done differently, you know? Should I have taken a few more games off during the regular season to prepare for that? Or I wish we would have closed out this series in six instead of seven and that extra travel day there and back, you know, could have mm -hmm. saved our legs. It's just things like that that I've thought about you know, day in and day out. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure that there's 80 million different scenarios that you could run in your head to say, maybe if this happened, this wouldn't have happened, we would have won, whatever the case may be. But I think there is a lot of power that comes in, like being at peace with knowing you did what you could and knowing that you're going to have another season to hopefully prove that again, too. How do you make, like, how do you find that positive out of it? Oh, uh, it's tough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my my coaches and my teammates know that, uh, you know, I I gave them all. Um, and I just, I, I honestly, I ran out. And it's not an excuse, right? Uh, what does that mean? You've said that. You said, like, I feel like I ran out. What do you mean by that? I was exhausted. Um, I was literally exhausted. I, I don't know if it was, I think it was, you know, we started off, we, at one point it was like 25 and 28. Mm -hmm. So go from the 11 seed to the second seed. And essentially we are playing, you know, 40 games, 35 games, you know, the last you know half of the season as if like we have to win every game. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of being in like not panic mode, but like, you know, that extreme sense of urgency yeah. for 40 straight games and then going to the playoffs and, the road we took was the toughest road that anybody would have had to take to the finals. Um, and I think just, you know, all things considered, it's a lot of things I've thought about, you know, changing my diet or, you know, maybe I could have taken some more games off. Um, just prepare a little bit differently, maybe in January for June mm -hmm. and not wait till I get to June um, to try to figure some things out. Yeah. Now, I know every single person in this room has heard people say, it's so hard to get to the finals. Like, it's hard to make it there. You got to get over the hump. You got to get there. And up until this one, we were all the same in terms of what we thought about the road to the finals. What did you think? Like, how hard did you think it was before you got there? <laughs> and then what did you really realize about how hard it is once you got there? Because I feel like it cannot be overstated how difficult that path is. I mean, you got first, second, and third round, best of seven. We played KD and Kyrie <laughs> in the first round, and we swept them. But if you go back, buzzer beater layup, second game we won by seven, third game we won by nine, fourth game we won by like five. So we, yeah, we swept them, but each game was extremely, extremely tough. Um, and then we go play the defending champs, and, you know, 
that was an, uh, a team that was just as big as we were. And, you know, they were missing Chris, um, but they were extremely physical, great defensive team. Obviously, they got Giannis. So we beating each other up for seven games. We get out of that. We got to leave the next day to go to Miami. And if we were the best defensive team, they were the second best defensive team in the playoffs. Yeah. And, yeah, we went to the finals. But game seven, that shot that Jimmy took, that three to, to – that could have sent us home. Yeah. Like, my stomach <laughs> dropped. <laughs> yes. Like, I remember him coming down the court. He pulled up for three. I didn't even look at the basket. I looked in the crowd because I was like, I can't, I can't look at that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? So it's just like little – like, one little change and we wouldn't have been there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So knowing that, right, knowing all of the things that have to go your way to make it to the finals, knowing everything the team has to do, knowing you went last year and you fell short, is there like a scared voice in the back of your head that says, what if I don't make it back? Mm -mm. No, I never I never think of like the worst case or like I'm never nervous or doubtful Mm -hmm. Uh, you either succeed or you fail right in my mind it's black or white you either I'm either gonna make this last second shot or I'm gonna miss it Mm -hmm. and I know it's it's a lot of people in the league that would be scared to take that shot uh, because they're afraid of what could you know happen Um, and I believe I you know I'm gonna make it back to the final I believe I'm gonna win one I believe I'm gonna make that shot Um, and if it doesn't happen you learn from it yeah. So it's never like, you know, listen to this voice like, you know, what if, what if. And if you like if you focus on that, it's you're like holding yourself back because mm-hmm. you got to realize people are going to say whatever people are going to talk. Uh, and my mom always told me, I mean, at least they talking about you. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, I never really lose much sleep about this thing like that. And I think something else you have on your side, too, is like you know who you are. Like you're a person that has a very solid like belief in who you are and what you can do. And I think that when you step into a role like this and you are a star in this league and you're wavering on who you are, it can be difficult. But because you have that solid foundation, you're always gonna be able to like bounce back to the next thing and look forward to the next thing, which is really important. I remember, and I think I wrote it down, but the day before the finals, you were in a press conference and you said, let me see. Have it. You said, there have been times where I questioned, am I the right kind of person to kind of lead a group like this? Give me an example of a time you questioned yourself or what you meant by that. The lowest point, I say this all the time, the lowest point of the season was um, we were up 25 in New York and R.J. Barry hit a three over me to win the game. The night before, we lost to San Antonio on the back-to-back at home. Uh, I think JB missed a layup to win the game. And uh, before that, I was out for like six days. I had COVID. So um, we were already like towing the line of 500. I get COVID. I come back. We lose to San Antonio. We up 25 in New York and we lose. And I remember on the bus to the uh, airport, I was just sitting there like, this shit is hard. It is, it is, it is hard being, you know, the guy on a team where you're supposed to, you know, lead them in the right direction night in and night out um, is, is hard. And moments like that um, make you appreciate winning. And um, like I, I tell people all the time, my first and third year, I was extremely, you know, fortunate, but I was on a really, really good team. And I say that is to say every night that we played, I expected us to win. Mm. My fourth year and the like the first like that stretch of the beginning of this season, that same level of like I didn't know. Like I knew we were good, I knew we were talented, but we we didn't put it put it together. So like going into an arena in a game of like Shit, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, yeah. it could go either way. Yeah. 
And I remember us getting back to that, you know, we won nine straight before the um, All-Star break. And then coming after the All-Star break, every game we played after that, I expected us to win. Like, I went into this, like, we're going to win tonight. And mm -hmm. I was like, I haven't felt that feeling since my third year and my first year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having those tough moments really made me appreciate, you know, when it's going good. Because yeah. it's, it's not always peaches and cream, you know. It's yeah, there's the, the and ebb and the flow. Mm -hmm. But you really, you felt that shift. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I feel like everyone kind of felt that shift. So it's just interesting to hear you say that because it was like very clear when it said, okay, they're getting this together. Mm -hmm. They're figuring this out. So when you talk about like questioning yourself and then growing out of that, do you now fully and wholeheartedly know that you can lead that team? For sure. It's like I was already extremely confident. And it's like, oh, shit, y'all let me get to the finals? <laughs> it's like, all right, I'll... I know how to get there, and now I just gotta, you know what I'm saying, I gotta do a little bit more. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's like, like you said, like I'm extremely comfortable with who I am, and I've always been extremely confident. Um, and that just continues to build and build year in and year out. Mm -hmm. So we talk about this long season, and because seasons are long, a lot of wear and tear happens during the season. Did you have to deal with any injuries throughout this season? Uh, actually, I did. Um, there was a, t we played the Hawks on a Sunday or was it Monday. Whenever the Super Bowl was, we played the Hawks at home. And, uh, I remember driving back to the house and I had my watch on and in the car, I keep looking at my wrist because it's like something is weighing on it. So, um, you know, long story short, my wrist was really, really bothering me. And, uh, you know, I started taping my wrist. I had a pad on it, and I started taping my wrist. In game. Yeah, in the game. Was taped. In the game. Uh, and my trainer, Nick, who is becoming famous by the day, uh, we had talked about getting it looked at before All-Star break. Uh, and I was like, fine, that's cool. But as All-Star break approached, I got nervous to get it looked at because I knew how much pain I was in. Like I couldn't really push my wrist back. I couldn't like at home, I couldn't hold a plate or a cup. Mm. Um, so after each game, I was wearing like a brace to keep it, you know, stable. I had to sleep in it. Um, but I was, I was nervous to go get it checked out because I never want somebody to tell me I can't play. You know, if, if anybody knows me, my teammates, like I never want to miss a game. I've tried to play every game of every season that I've can. Um, I hate coming out, you know, I hate getting subbed out. I hate missing. So I, I like pushed it to the side. I didn't go get it checked out, um, before all-star break. Fast forward to right before the playoffs during the play-in game, we had six or seven days off and Nick was like, yo, we got to get it looked at. I'm like, all right, that's cool. But like, it's the playoffs. So I don't care what they say. Like I'm playing. Yeah. Come to find out this was eight weeks later that they, it showed that I had, um, had a non-displaced fracture in my wrist. And it was like, it was small, but it was still but like- But still, yeah. Like a, a non-displaced chip. So like I chipped a bone, but it didn't like leave the surface, right? Um, but it has shown that the bone that grew over it, so it healed, but it was still pain. I was still in pain because I kept getting it hit or falling on it. Uh, so like, I guess I played with like somewhat of a fracture for, for like two months. Um, wow. And then in the playoffs, there was a play against against Milwaukee in game three. Um, I dunked it. Giannis chased me down and he fouled me and I fell into the to the um to like the crowd. And that was the most painful it's been since that day, um, that I heard it. And I ended up getting a cortisone shot in my wrist um that night and you could see it. Um uh, Yeah, it's like much lighter. I've lost like yeah. color in my hand because it kills the fat cells and there's not a lot of fat in my hand. Yeah. So, like, I've lost color right there. But, you know, after each game, I would have to, like, wear a brace, you know, to shoot around. And I would take it off before the camera saw me. And then, you know, pregame, taking my nap, and I have to put it back on, you know, just to make yeah. sure it was stable. So no one knew you were dealing with this injury besides, like, internally? Yeah, besides the team. Yeah. But it's like, in my mind, if, I, if I'm going out there to play, it's like nothing matters. Like, right. if you, everybody's banged up, a little hurt. 
you know, if you're injured, then you can't play. But that was my whole reason of I was scared to get an MRI because I was like, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't want anybody to tell me I can't play. Yeah. So. But in what ways, if any, did that injury actually affect how you played? Uh, it was just tough. You know, this is not my dominant hand, but, you know, it wasn't as stable. And any time driving to the lane, falling, somebody smacking it, it was just like this extreme, like excruciating pain right here. And, you know, oftentimes if you pay attention closely, I'm like shaking my hand or I'm like mm -hmm. at the free throw line, like trying to like calm it down. Um, you know, and that would be every game. Really? Oh, my goodness. And now... How does it feel? Uh, it's all good. I, you know, taking time off to let it heal yeah. properly and, you know, not get re-aggravated yeah. um, and things like that. Yes, definitely knock on wood. And also shout out to Nick. <laughs> Making sure you would get that. Good old Nick. I hope you're out there watching. Um, but no, I mean, I'm glad it isn't bothering you anymore. And obviously I wish you an injury-free uh, rest of your career. Um, Obviously, there has been a lot of talk and focus on this turnaround that the team had. How did it happen? All these things. I don't necessarily want to know how the turnaround happened. I want to know what conversation made the turnaround happen. Because I hear there was a players only meeting involved around this time. Um, I wouldn't say it wasn't like a one sit down meeting. We had a good group and obviously we made trades you know, midway through the season. But we didn't, like, we always had a good group and we always had guys that were willing and wanted to buy in and wanted to figure it out. And I just tell people all the time, like, I just didn't know what it was, but we were, like, one click away. And once, like, I, once I realized that, you know, once we figure it out, that we're going to take off. And um, I give all the credit to, you know, the guys on the team, coaching staff, Excuse me, Ime, um, you know, everybody, nobody's, you know, demeanor or feelings wavered. We know yeah. we came back from a West Coast trip. We was one in four and it was just like it wasn't like, you know, we might not figure it out. It was just like once we do, we just got to do it. And, uh, you know, that's when I, I always had faith because, you know, everybody was always in good spirits. Um, and, you know, and once we did. I don't know what it, what changed, but you know we never looked back. But is there a conversation that sticks out from that time? I mean, people always talk about some conversation me and JB had, um, but I mean, it wasn't like we never talked to each other. And one day we talked. Like we always had conversations. Um, I mean, maybe some days like yo, we like maybe need to do more or. We need to like watch film together a little bit more or whatever it is. Um, but there wasn't like a, you know, just formal way I sit down. Yeah. I mean, I think it's clear to everyone that like for whatever reason, there's always like a Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum conversation in the media. Everyone's talking about, do you guys get along? Are you friends? Can you coexist? All these things. And I'm sure for some of you, you believe a lot of that is a media thing. But one thing I, I really think about when I think about you two is when I had Bradley on the show and we were talking about him and John Wall. And he was like, you know, John and I didn't really have an issue with each other, but the media talked about it so much that we had to have a conversation about the media and about one another. Did you and Jalen also have to have like a similar, this is what's going on, let's clear the air and figure out why this is happening? Uh not clear the air, but more just like, you know, let's block out all the noise, regardless of what they say. We believe that we can coexist, that we can be the leaders on this team and, you know, get all the way. Um, because, you know, I believe in how hard you work and how much you care and you believe in how much I how much I care, how hard I work. Um, and it's going to be that much better when we do figure it out. Um, but, you know, the media does have like an obsession with like the Jays. Right. I guess, you know, we both kind of got a similar first name a year apart. But it's like we're two totally different players. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody just likes to group us in together. And it's I don't know where it came from, um, but, you know, it makes for a better story, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, we everyone knows definitively now, like you all work. We've seen it. You all made it to the finals together. But was there a moment where you were like, OK, 
Can we work? Will we be able to make this work? I know. I always knew we could. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody talking about, you know, they should have to trade one or the other. They got to pick. And it's like, wait, it's two guys that's under 26, you know, at, you know, one of the best players in their respective position, um, you know, two-way players. Like, why would you ever want to split that up? And it's like nobody can win a championship together until they do it. Yeah. So it was like, well, yeah, we haven't won one. So, yeah, you could say we can't do it. But, you know, it's not like we don't have any time left. Yeah. We're both still young. Yeah. I always wonder this, too. And, again, I think about what Bradley was talking about. He said that so much of it, too, was like two people that both wanted to be the guy for them. And I wonder sometimes the role that plays with, like, both of you know you're good. Both of you know you're stars. And you're figuring out how to both be stars on one team. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But do you feel like that would play a role at all? I don't think so. No. Um, we, I've got a great deal of respect for him and, and likewise. And there's no like competition. Like mm -hmm. I, when he made his first all-star team, I was extremely happy for him because mm -hmm. I know how much that meant to him, how much, how hard he worked for that and yeah. that he deserved it. Um, and you know, it's enough money and attention and shots or whatever to go around. There are. Like, <laughs> yeah. We we on the same team and we trying to accomplish something together. Yeah. No matter how many points either of us score when we wasn't winning, that shit did not matter. Mm -hmm. But when we start winning and we both was playing well, you know, then you know, winning cures everything. When you're not winning then they could pin, nitpick at any little thing. But For when sure. you're winning, you know, everybody's happy. Okay. Also, before we move on from Jalen, I want to give you a chance to like clear the air on something. Um, you know, when you and Katie were working out, everybody made a very big deal about the photo. And I don't really think people understand what the off season in L.A. is like. Everyone is working out together. Um, so just talk about that photo, that moment and that it was what it actually was for you. It goes back to your earlier question, like, what do you give up being Jason Tatum? It's like they exaggerate everything I do. Mm -hmm. Right. I've known KD since I was in high school. We were on the USA team together. We spent five weeks together last year from Vegas to Tokyo. We won a gold medal. Like, you know, we have a a, a bond. Like, that's my yeah. brother. Um, and it's like, I'm not too proud to say KD's one of the best players ever. So if, like, one of the best players wants to work out with you and I could learn some things from him, like, why would I say no? Right. And it's just... If if you worry about too, uh, if you worry too much about what other people think are going to say, you'll drive yourself crazy. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy that I can't work out with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> right? yeah. Like that's all it was. We was working out together. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, trying to get better. Yeah. Um, you know the other thing I never understand too about social media and how these things get started. I'm like. Why are y'all acting like we were doing this in secret? Like, we posted the photo. <laughs> so we clearly don't think there was, like, something going on. We were just working out. But everybody spins it and makes it their own thing. And it's like, if this would have, if trade rumors would have never came out, nobody would have ever said anything. It's right. Like, I've been cool with KD before. Whatever people said or didn't say on the internet about a trade or anything like that. Like, yeah. No, it's, the internet is, I always say to people, when I just had Mark Cuban on the show, we're like, the internet's not a real place. Like, I went to Draymond's wedding. Like, yeah. they just beat us in the finals. And, you know, it was kind of tough seeing all the, the team there. But, like, <laughs> you know, Draymond is a great friend of mine. And, yeah. you know, I felt honored that he wanted me to be at that special day. And yeah. it was like, you know, we've had a relationship before we played in the finals. And everybody just thinks, like, basketball is 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 your life. And you shouldn't have a life outside of that. Yeah. Okay, but also, the photo y'all all took... So good. In the booth. Oh, yeah. It's so good. That was... So how did that... Also, shout out to Ray BB, by the way. All her photos are fire. Um, but in that photo, obviously you're out at the wedding, but like what happens? They're taking the photos and then are they just like, Jason! Yeah. Uh, so I seen the photo booth and there was a long line and Bron and uh, Steph and Draymond, they took a picture with... They all got four rings. And uh, I was... Walking past, and Rich, Rich Paul was right there, and he grabbed me. He like, yo, come on, take this picture with us. I wasn't going to say no. <laughs> so I was like, all right, and we got in the picture. We took like a normal one, 
Mm-hmm. And then Draymond was like, man, it's my wedding. We got to turn up. So we just started dancing. Yeah. No, the, the photos are so good. That's one like you have to get framed. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That's got to like go in the house framed. It's, it's so nice. Um, okay. I want to go back to something we were talking about a bit earlier, which is about you being vocal. I think that when you first entered the league, there was a lot of people that had this <clears> idea that like you weren't vocal. There was criticisms about you being vocal and your leadership. Have you seen yourself become more vocal as the years like went by? Yeah. In my own way. Yeah. You know, cause you still have to be who you are in that. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody tries to put what they want on you, like what they think you should be doing. You know, they put that on you. And, you know, if you're going to be a Celtic great and you have to act like KG, it's like I'm not Kevin Garnett. Like I don't come off like that um, or you have to act this way. Um, and you do it like it's, you got to be comfortable with being yourself. You got to do what works for you. You know, I'm not. The, the loudest guy that's going to do all the antics to show the crowd or show the, the people on TV that, you know, I care. You know, I talk in the huddle. I talk in the locker room, you know, when it's needed. Um, and my teammates know that. Um, you know, I'm the first one in the gym. I'm always the last one to leave. Um, and that's just something that they don't, you know, that the world doesn't see. Mm-hmm. And it's like the more that they try to push something on you, the more I'm going to be like, you know what? I'm actually going to continue to do it the way I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, because that's who I am. Yeah. I mean, would you think, like, say I had a graph. Would you being vocal correlate to your performance as well? Like, as you continued to become more confident in who you were as a basketball player, did you be more confident in how you led? Does that make sense? Um, I think I'm... Trying to get what you're saying. Like, you becoming more vocal, what do you attribute that to? Like, as you continue to do it more and more, why? You just get more experience. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're a better interviewer now than you were five years ago. Yeah. And that just comes with experience. Um, and that's all I really can attribute it to. Um, mm-hmm. I was 19 when I first got here. Now I'm 24. And, um, I'm just a different person, and I'll have more experience in four years. So I hope that I'm a better leader and a better basketball player in four years than I am now. Yeah. Okay, this is this is a serious question, but at what age do you think people will stop talking about how old you are? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, because I do I, – being a father and – been five years in the league now i like i might like carry myself as like an older person and then i'll be somewhere and i'm like i'll say something like yo i was born in 98 and everybody at the table be like oh my god oh yeah yeah you were born in 98 that's like damn i am only 24 yeah (laughs) but i never feel like it like being in my profession i'm always around older people deuce is four now I just feel so much older and it's like I don't want to be I love being young yeah um so I probably got like once I get to 26 they gotta yeah they gotta. stop the he's only 19 yeah because I was gonna say there's always the he's only 19 and now everything is like you know he's doing this and he's just 24 and tell me if this makes sense but in some ways I wonder if you being so good so early like hurt you because it like skewed the expectations of you like now what everybody wants from you it's like well you have already had these great years and so now it's like every year is going to have to be more but you've done the great stuff Mm. do you ever feel that I mean that's part of it like you know I'm certain that some people would probably think I've been in the league longer than I actually have right um, because you know has so much you know early success um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't change it. I would rather it be how it is and, you know, I'd just start winning, I guess, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, but, you know, people's expectations just continue to grow. Um, the thing that does, like, bother me sometimes is, like, um, I hear stuff, they be like, he's one of the best young players in the league. I was like, well, 
I, you don't have to put the young part. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, I'm one of the best players. And it's not like I'm arrogant or anything. It's like, you know, age doesn't matter. Like, we all play on the same court in the same league. You know, you one of the best guys or you're not. So yeah. I, I never really liked that he's one of the best young players. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And on that, on this show, we talk a lot about star and superstar. Are you a superstar right now? What is a superstar? Let's have that. That, that, is, that is why we talk about it a lot. We go back and forth all the time. How do you define superstar? Because I feel like I'm the poster child of like, is he a superstar yet? Yeah, you are. For one. I feel like it's like you and Luca. For one, I feel like that debate has been going on for like a year and a half, two years. And it always, I was always curious because I was like, wait, did I ever say like prematurely I was a superstar and I wasn't yet? Or did my mom tweet something or... Like, why was I the person of, like, is he a superstar yet? No or yes or, like, why was I the person for that debate? Mm -hmm. I, I, I never, like, what did I do? Yeah. Like, how did you end up being that guy? Like, because that's the narrative around, like, is he a superstar Yeah. Yet? Well, I think it goes back to what I was saying about you being so good so early and what you were bringing to Boston. It was just easy for everyone to put that conversation on you because— Everything that we talk about, that debate, you almost embodied it. So what is How do you, because everybody has a different definition of what a superstar is. For sure. Some people say there's a list of six. Some people have a list of 12. And so what, what would, how would you define what a superstar is? I think that there aren't that many superstars. How many are there? I'm kind of in that. I would say... Six. What? Superstars. I think there's a lot of stars. I have probably more stringent like criteria of what I think a superstar is. Because then you start, so you'll start naming them. And then you say, well, is this player actually in the same category as a LeBron or Steph? And so if you have those two people as kind Six. of what your marker is, what other players are in that tier? I got, you get, do you get what I'm saying? I'm almost afraid to ask you, like, is this person a superstar? <laughs> like, I want to ask you, like, is because you said there's only six. I, in my head, think of six. But, I mean, you, it, it doesn't matter to me. You can ask Is me. Kyrie Irving a superstar? Yes. Kyrie is. So, okay. I, Do you I, want like, me to I, say I, what I think about you? I agree. Okay. But then, is Damian Lillard a superstar? I think that Damian has all of the superstar qualities. But it's hard to put him in it in this moment because of he just like needs a little more. But obviously, he like needs, he has that in him. Needs a little more. I mean, he's got to win. He's got to get there. Like that. It to me, that's a that's some of it. So you, so like champion, I think championships matter. But it's not even like for example, I think that this year solidified you in that conversation. I don't think that in the beginning of the season I would have said that about you. And I've been open about that. I've tweeted like he's on the way to being a superstar. Mm -hmm. Like you're very clearly a star. But I think now you're like you're able to say that because of what you have proven. There is something to what you prove. And it's also like what does being a superstar mean if there's 20 of them? There's more than six. But how many would you say there are? I don't know, 14, 12, 14. Damian Lillard is a superstar. Yeah, I mean, and I get, I'm not like saying you're wrong in that. I think that we have like our, our different opinions. I love Dame. I think he's incredibly talented. But I also just think if we're coveting what superstar is, at what point are you almost like changing the meaning of so many people can be one? And maybe there are 15, 14. I just think that's, it's a difference be, in opinion. There can be superstars. And then there are a few guys in the league right now that are like all time greats. So yes, like, there is a difference between KD, Braun, and Dame. Like, those are two of the greatest mm -hmm. and, like, top 10, 12 players of all time. And while Dame might not be top 15 player of all time, he it wasn't NBA 75. So, like, the six that you might be referring to are, like, probably, like, all-time top 20 players. Mm -hmm. But That's fair. There are, but you, are you a superstar? I guess, like, <laughs> depending on what. And the criteria, that's the thing. The criteria is different for everyone. I absolutely agree with that. And I don't think it's like what one person says is like the Bible. 
No, with for sure. other, you know, like I get why someone would say Dame is like I. That's no, a no, very no, valid no. argument. Dame it, is a fantastic basketball player. For sure, you and know. For sure, and it's it. Like I value your opinion, and there are some people on TV that there I don't value their opinions. Like you yeah, don't know what you're talking about, but I don't know. It's just like, do I have the respect of the people I play against? Mm-hmm. Do they know like, you know, what I'm capable of, and they got a game plan a certain way? Like if I've earned that respect of the guys that I got to compete against night in and night out, and they know what I bring to the table, then you know that's all that. That's what really matters because they really know. Totally. And again, and I, I want your take on this too. I have always said I think players should be involved in the voting of all things. Like I think that it's ridiculous that when we're doing all this voting, players don't have a voice. You really should only care about like what the players think of you. They are the ones that know you inside and out. They're who you go up against. I know that you have had some words about how we can change this uh, voting process. Please tell us. Um, how you would like to change it? <laughs> um, I mean, there's no a thousand percent perfect way to change it, but I do think it's unfair to us and unfair to you guys. There's a lot of pressure mm-hmm. for you guys to have to make a decision that could directly impact somebody's what they could like, how much money they can earn. Um, you know, that's a, that's a lot to, to be asked of you guys. Um, you know, and there's a lot of talk of like, should it be positions or should it be the five best players? Because Embiid was second in MVP voting, but then made second team All NBA. Agree, that was yeah. If you don't know sports, that just yeah, that that doesn't make sense. Um, I'm on. I'm with you. It should be positionless. It's just like the top players should be All NBA because then it's like if you're getting votes as like a guard, but you could also get votes as a forward. Yeah, it's like and it, it, it gets up. difficult. It, yeah. I, so the year I didn't make it when I you know missed out on you know earning that bonus, uh, you know I had to kind of split my votes up between some people thought I was a guard, some people thought I was a forward, and if it would have just been like all forward, the point system I would have made it, and it's just like too tricky. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, and it's tough because, you know, I, w- I could say that people in the front office should be the ones that vote because they, you know, really watch every game. But, you know, they have their own agendas at time. And mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, you know, I could talk on and on for days about this, but, um, you know, it's just some things is just – don't sit right with me. Yeah. No, and look, I agree. I have said on here multiple times the the process should be changed. I would understand why a player is frustrated with how it happens. Like, all of that makes total sense. So, I get that. Um, one more little bucket of questions I want to ask you before we we'll go to fan questions and you're, and I'm out of your hair. Um, who interviewed you first? Me or Anthony Novelli? The kid I went to high yeah. school with? <laughs> I yeah. watched the YouTube video. Oh. <laughs> He did, because... He did? That was, like, seventh grade. Okay. I was, um, like, what? Freshman year? Eighth grade freshman year. Yeah, eighth grade freshman year, when you didn't decide to go to U of I. You have a wealth of great young videos on YouTube. <laughs> Do you know how to tie a tie now? Uh, Honestly, no. <laughs> was, and it's wild, because I was in, a like, a web design class, mm-hmm. and, like... We had to make a YouTube account and post videos, and you know now that video has millions of views. It has so many views. It's like six million. I just looked at it, and I'm like, <laughs> I never would have thought when I made that how to tie a tie video um, that they would have. I mean, but the internet finds everything. Yeah, a very, a uh, very young Jason. And speaking of young Jasons, I know that you call Deuce your mini me a lot. Um, he's so lively, has the best personality. When you see what Deuce has become to the world, how does it make you feel? Are you a little uncomfortable with how famous Deuce is now? Yeah, extremely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, Because he didn't ask for that. And, you know, I asked for it by being who I am. So it comes with the job. But... um, you know, there's a lot of things that I have to, like, think about and worry about 
as he gets older and, you know, is going to venture off into this world. Um, that, you know, makes me a little uneasy. Like the thought of him going to school of like, maybe I need to send like a security guard to school, um, to just make like, you know, maybe not be in a classroom would be outside the classroom. Um, and that's not normal. I keep saying it's not normal, but it's like things that I, I have to really think about. Um, because for one, we live in a crazy, crazy world. And, you know, I always think about like when I was growing up, you know, my mom, if I was, especially when I started driving, like she would ask me, where am I going? Who's going to be there? Send me the address, let me know. And I just be like, mom, like, relax I'm gonna be all right yeah. and she used to always tell me like you won't understand until you have one of your own and I feel that more than anything like I am terrified for him to go to school go on a field trip go on an AAU trip just like the thought of not being able to be there to protect them or like whatever is a is a, is a frightening feeling so yeah I wish he could stay this age forever, but he is growing up extremely fast. Um, and he is a brand. Like, yeah. Deuce is extremely well known. And with social media and everything, I'm trying to navigate, um, trying to navigate that the right way as yeah. much as possible. But I mean, even saying that, being a, like, what percentage of being a parent is being scared? You know, they say you can't live your life in fear, but it's like there's a, a appropriate level of fear to be like prepared. Um, I don't, I don't know the percent, but it's it's high. It's high, <laughs> yeah. It is high. He hasn't even went to school yet. Uh, like you know, I'm I'm very laid back, but like when it comes to Deuce, like uh, like we went on. We took a couple visits to some like preschools to talk and see the um, the schools and facilities, and you know, in my mind, it's preschool. How much can they learn? You know, what I'm saying they're gonna take naps and play and be with other kids. <laughs> yeah. But you know, my mom and his mom asking all the 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 right questions and things like that. And the only question I ever have is like, not even question, just like, you know, if we decide to send him here. Um, I need to know that it's okay that, you know, if I'm coming from practice or if we have a day off, if I just want to come up here and sit in a classroom and watch him all day, like that has to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I'm, I'm very mild mannered and laid back, but like about him, I will, like, I know people say like, they don't play about their kids. I don't play about, I don't play about my son. So. Yeah. Um, try and figure it out. What do you want Deuce to know about the way you love him? What do I want him to know about the way I love him? The way I love him. Um, you know, when they say you love someone, so, like, you know, they'd be like, I killed somebody for you. That's how much I love you. When you, like, would give your life for somebody, have you ever seen John Q? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't understand that until I had a, a child. And, like, that was an extreme, you know, dramatic movie. But, yeah, like, push come to shove, if, if I got something to, and I'm the only person that can give it to him and that mean giving my life up, like, I wouldn't think twice about it. So I think people without kids don't understand that that love because most people without kids wouldn't give their life up for somebody. Um, but if it meant that he would be okay and that he would live his life, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think twice about it. So like, that's how much mm -hmm. I love him. Yeah. And I'm sure even at a young age, like he knows and feels yeah. that, you know, we, and you and I have had conversations about, about parents and the things that, you know, can pass down to your children and things like that. But when you think about yourself and you think about Deuce, what is a character trait of yours that you're like, I want him to also be this? And what is something about yourself you do not want him to be like? <laughs> uh, 
I want him to be as confident as I am and I, as I've always been, um, you know, in, in any situation, in any room that he walks in to, you know, always walk in with your head high and, you know, um, as yourself, you know, never, never change because of the company you're around or the room that you're in, you know, always be genuine and authentic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if people accept that, great if they don't then that's not the room you should be in so that's something I've I've always been I've always been myself I've always been confident regardless of you know who I was with where I was at and that's something that you know I want to instill in him something that I don't want him to do that I did is have a kid at 19 you know mm-hmm. um, get married first have a family not that I regret it is the best thing ever, but uh, you know, having a kid at nineteen may not be the most ideal thing mm-hmm. to do. Yeah, you know, when I, I see like you and Deuce, I really do think about how close you and your mom are. Like that's your best friend. Um, she is like I feel like you almost can't explain you without explaining Miss Brandy. She's the best. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your first memory of your mom? <clears throat> my first memory of mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a great question. My first memory? Mm. Uh, man. That's so me. I don't know. I used to... I slept in the bed with my mom till I was like 13. Um, I was such a mama's boy. Like anytime her friends would come over and they would be playing spades at the table, like I would fall asleep on her lap because I like had separation anxiety. Like I never wanted to be away from my mom. Uh, so just you know everything. Like I used to, we used to watch Love Jones together when I was a kid. That was my favorite movie. Um, and Players Club. <laughs> yeah. You know, I probably shouldn't have been watching that at five, but you know, I was. Well, your mom has a memory that she wants to share with you. That I'm going to show you. <laughs> you know, I uh, I was with Jason at Katie's premiere, and he says to me, "Who's my video going to be?" And I was like, "I didn't have a video." <laughs> <laughs> but I said, "You know what? There is nobody he would want to hear from more." than one of his parents. So here is a, a message from your mom. Hey Jay, it's me. Um, when Taylor gave me this assignment, the objective was to share some story that you've never heard or tell you something I've never told you to solicit an, a, some sort of organic response. And I have struggled because we don't really keep secrets. I know everything. And we have such an open relationship that um, I couldn't think of anything that I haven't shared with you before. However, the one thing that came to my mind that really resonated with me is if you remember when you were a little boy, about six, seven, eight years old, and I used to be in the bathroom outside your room and I would come in your room with a brush or a remote and I'd stick it in your face while you were in the middle of playing a game or something. And I would say, ask you all these impromptu questions and ask you, what are you going to say when they ask you this? And what are you going to say when they ask you that? And you would often be annoyed and you would look at me and you would ask mom, who's going to ask me these questions? And I would say, duh, the reporter is from like ESPN and TNT. And you know, you're going to be one of the best players in the world. And you would laugh and, you would say then, you would roll your eyes again and you would say, well, you have to feel that way. You're my mom. (laughs) Well, guess what? There's a lot of people feel that way now. Turns out I was right. And I know at that young age, you didn't know, but again, it wasn't, but maybe a year or two later, shortly thereafter in the fourth grade, I think that you even began to realize like, this is a realistic goal, a realistic dream. And Um, Ever since then, I have watched you relentlessly attack every goal, every accomplishment, everything that you've ever wanted to do. I've watched you put in the work. I've watched you have the level of commitment and discipline and passion that is honestly unmatched. I've never seen anyone at that young of an age. And 
Um, people are often in awe of my accomplishments, being a single mom and going to law school and all of that. But that's because they didn't get a chance to watch you. And I have been in awe of you <laughs> since you were a little boy. And just the discipline, the maturity, the level of commitment, the dedication, the passion, the work ethic, everything that you've put into perfecting your craft and pursuing your dreams has just been amazing to watch. And what's even more impressive is that as great of a basketball player you are, and by the way, you are one of the best players in the world, <laughs> you're an even better dad, like by a landslide. And so I am just honored to be your mom. I'm grateful for the opportunity to get to be on this journey with you. I am um, just blessed to be able to watch you not only pursue your dreams, but be the very best dad that Deuce could ever ask for. And I just want you to re always remember how proud I am of you, that I'm your biggest fan and always will be. Deuce may try to argue with that with me, but um, <laughs> he can be 1B. Um, but I just want you to always remember, we always have your back. We'll always be in your corner. And I love you and I'm proud of you. And um, just to think this is, Everything that you have accomplished thus far at 24 and we're just getting started is pretty scary. So um, we're just going to sit back and continue to enjoy this journey with you. And I just have one last question. What's next, Superstar? <laughs> <laughs> All right. To end, you have to answer your mom's question. What's next? What's next, Superstar? Um. Well, I haven't won a championship yet, and I haven't been an MVP. So uh, that's what's next. That's next on the list. Um, yeah, that was cool. Yeah. That was cool. I, I loved that video. And again, I just think that you all's relationship is so special, and everything she's saying about you as a dad is is so true. So thank you for doing this. And above all else, I have, I've known you a very long time. I'm very proud of you. I'm happy for you. I'm thankful for your friendship. I'm thankful that you gave us this time here. And onward, always Appreciate more. You. Thank you. Of course. Appreciate of course. it. Thanks, Jason.